welcome module 1 transportation engineering and road development process uh, there is one lesson under this module after completing this lesson the student will be able to develop an understanding about transportation engineering as a subject they will be able to define and under understand the scope of transportation engineering. Student will be able to understand the advantages of road transportation over other modes of transportation and they will student will be able to develop an understanding about the overall road development process. <coughs> To start with, transportation engineering is defined by the Institute of Transportation Engineers popularly known as IT as follows. Application of technology and scientific principles to the planning, functional design, operation and management of facilities for any mode of transportation in order to provide for the safe, rapid, comfortable, convenient, economical and environmentally compatible movement of people as well as goods. So, one way it covers planning, functional design, operation and management, it takes into consideration different modes of transportation, look at the aspects like safety, also the comfort, convenience and due consideration on environmental aspect and it includes both movement of people and goods. So, here you can see that in this photograph it is indicates that road transportation, this is an example of rail transportation, here it is an example of air transportation. Now, the importance of transportation in the development of a country is really multidimensional. We normally say that the economy of a country rolls on transport. Transport is a major factor that can you know boost the uh, economic development of a country. We all know that all human beings are interacting over distance and time for food, for shelter, work, business, recreation and security. We need to transport agricultural and industrial raw materials and also the finished products, equipments and that is why the need for transportation arises. So, there is a special distribution of activity, people stay somewhere, they need to go to various places, raw materials are produced somewhere manufactured, you know, uh, processed somewhere else, the market is again at different places. So, the special characteristics, it generates the transportation demand or travel demand for passenger travel. If you look at the development facilities, it is really a cyclic process, that is what I am trying to convey. You develop in when you are trying to develop an area, you go for planning, initial planning, then you carry out preliminary design, then once you screen alternatives, take the best one and then go for detailed engineering design. Then once the detailed engineering design is ready, you can go for construction. Once the facility is constructed, it is used by or for the transportation of people and goods. So, operation takes place, 
over a period of time the demand grows, so the transportation uh, demand grows, the facilities may get congested, additional demand may get generated. So, again you need to go for planning and this cyclic process continues. So, development or planning or whatever you say, uh, it is not a one time job, it is essentially a cyclic process. You develop facilities, for developing facilities you need for planning, you carry out preliminary engineering, screen the alternative, take the best possible option and then carry out detailed design, construct it, put the facility for use and then over a period of time again operation problems will be there, demand will get generated, additional demands will come, demand will grow otherwise also. So, there will be additional demand for facilities, so again you go for planning and accordingly you keep adding facilities which uh, should be compatible with the growth. So, this is essentially a cyclic process. Now, let us look at different modes of transport. As I have already indicated, it is necessary to consider the movement of passengers as well as goods. People are required to move from one place to another place. Goods are also required to be transported from one place to another place. So, there are different modes of transport, say for example, railways, a popular mode of transport. Under railways also you have surface railways, underground railways, elevated railways. Then you have road transportation or road based transportation. You also have air transportation, you have water transportation, we also have sometimes ropeways and also we use pipeline transportation. So, there are a wide variety of modes that can be used for transportation of uh, persons or as well as transportation of goods. Now, obviously, in this course, our focus is on road transportation sector. So, primarily we talk about road transportation sector. We discuss about various aspects around road transportation. So, although there are different modes of transport, our primary focus will be on road transportation. With that background, let us try to look at the road transportation sectors. Among all the modes of transportation, road transportation is the nearest to people for various reasons. Say, because of low capital investment, these are all relative term because we are generally making a comparison. Of course, it, 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 it varies a lot what type of road you are talking. If you are uh, talking maybe uh, high speed facilities, then uh, maybe very good quality road, it may be very expensive. So, it also depends on what type of roads you are talking. But this is a general comparison, generally ro road or road transportation we can consider them as low capital, comes under low capital investment. Road transportation offers flexible service, they offer more freedom to users while traveling, you can stop, you can go, okay. They have the ability to accommodate various types of vehicles at a time. It is the same road space that is shared by a number of vehicles. So, different vehicle types, they are sharing the same, same road space for movement. It offers quick and assured door to door service. Remember that we have other modes of transportation which are even faster, say air transportation, even the rail transportation. But rail transportation cannot offer door to door service, air transportation cannot offer door to door service. So, that is another distinct advantage of road transportation. It offers faster and cheaper service particularly for short distance travel. If you consider a very long distance travel, travel between two countries, may, road transportation may not be a feasible option. So, there may be air transportation is faster. 
even you consider a big country like India from one corner to another corner, it is a substantial distance. So, one may find that rail transportation is more suitable, but generally for short to medium branch travel and door to door service that it provides, road, road transportation definitely had, has got distinct advantages. Now, let us try to see or uh, try to understand the scope of highway engineering because as I indicated transportation uh, really is a major factor which can accelerate or which can influence the economic development and growth of a country. It has got a very big impact on developmental process and since our concentration is more on road transportation, road transportation has also got distinct advantages and with all this understanding, uh, governments and also various other bodies, uh, they have realized the need for road sector or the importance of road sector. Accordingly, countries like India have taken up massive road development projects. So, essentially concentration is on road sector and uh, more, more precisely on highway sector. So, let us look at the scope of highway engineering when we say highway development projects. It includes planning and location of facilities. It includes then alignment selection and geometric design. Once you have decided the alignment and decided the geometrics or designed the geometric components, one has to go for pavement design. So, this is a very major aspect of the overall work along with geometric design and alignment selection. And remember that pavement constitutes about 40 percent of the total highway project cost on an average. Again, it depends what is the terrain condition, what is the soil condition, what type of roads we are talking about, but generally it constitutes about 40 percent of the total project cost. So, this is a very, very important aspect. Then we also have to look at the materials that are to be used for road constructions, what type of material, conventional materials, any new type of material. We'll also look at the construction technology aspect, how we construct road, how we produce a better quality of construction, faster construction and then obviously, the maintenance aspect of the road. This is also very important because whatever you construct over a period of time, you will require maintenance. So, what should be the maintenance strategy, what should be the process for maintenance, how we maintain roads, at what interval, what we do, all the aspects will come. Then once the facilities are developed, traffic operation and its control, this is again another aspect. We want to create facility, but at the same time, we want our facility to operate at maximum efficiency. So, given the supply, given the infrastructure, how best we can make use of the available infrastructure through efficient control on management system. So, traffic operation and control has a very big role to play in the overall context. Then we have to look at the economics aspect, finance and administration, all are important. In terms of road development, we have to think where from the funding will come. So, the finance part of it is important, administration part of it is also important and we have to give due emphasis on environmental and social impacts. We must not carry out road development projects uh, at the cost of environment. So, certainly it will be called development when we can make safe and efficient movement, we can ensure safe and efficient movement without degradation to environmental quality. That means, protecting the environmental aspects. That is what is very important. Now, as I have already mentioned, India and many other countries, they have taken the road development projects in a massive way. So much emphasis is there now on road development projects, so many ambitious road development projects have been formulated, particularly I am referring to the projects uh, which are taken off in the recent time for making uh, 
a better quality highways, national highways and also uh, state road projects are taken up to improve the uh, state highways, national highways, state highways. Of course, we have, uh, you have not learned the functional classification, but generally I am referring to highways means where uh, traffic use the facility particularly for long distance travel. So, in the context of road development, uh, in the modern era road development, uh, how the road development is really done. So, we need to understand uh, the overall process of road development and that is a, a major emphasis of this uh, today's lecture or lesson is on uh, developing an understanding about the overall road development process, particularly highways. See, if we see major road development projects, it involves uh, various steps involving client, consultant, as well as contractor. Many of you are familiar with this term, what we mean by client. Okay? So, in India, maybe uh, this national highways are now upgradation of national highways are done by National Highways Authority of India. So, we can call that National Highways Authority of India as a client. So, that ask for technical help from consultants. A number of engineering consultancy firms they are working uh, then and they provide or help the client by making the design, making the project report and all other supporting documents and detailed uh, engineering aspect. Then once all those things are done, contractor is also important, uh, they are also involved because they actually execute the construction part of the projects. So, it involves a number of steps and also it involves client, consultant and the contractor. I will describe the overall road development process in three broad steps. There will be essentially three broad steps through which I will try to explain it. Let us look at step 1. It includes basically preparation of various reports including establishing the prioritization what is important because certainly you have maybe several thousand kilometer of roads which need upgradation. You cannot take up 10,000 kilometer of roads in one year due to fiscal constraints, due to physical constraints, due to manpower constraints and all other supporting logistic constraints. So, you need to prioritize the road. So, you prioritize it, one needs to carry out economic and financial viability, check it, check the economic and financial viability, environmental and social impact assessment, then after preliminary screening and PPR, go for detail engineering need to carry out the cost estimation and then preparation of international bid document what is uh, uh, com commonly known as ICB document. Okay? So, up to the preparation of document that we can consider as step 1. That means, by the end of step 1, everything has been decided which road to be taken off, what all other options have been studied, we have selected the best one, okay. we have judged the economic viability of the project, we have ensured the environmental protection part of it related to road development, every element for every element the detailed design is ready, drawings are ready, the report is ready and it is now ready for construction, we can go for construction. So, step 2, what once this bid document is ready, normally a contractor is procured or appointed to carry out the execution of the project. So, now the execution part come. Whatever we have described in step 1, so all the detail engineering, drawing, everything is known, what exactly how it is to be constructed. So, the contractor will carry out the execution part of the project in terms of construction and also at this stage for bigger projects a supervision consultant is appointed basically to supervise contractors job and site to provide additional technical support help and cooperation to construct to contractor 
maybe some changes might have occurred in the area, some changes may be necessary in the design. So, contractor also gets the support from the supervision consultant. So, minor changes in the design and the drawing may be necessary at this stage. Now, step 3, in case of BOT or maybe annuity projects uh, with modern IDA road development, the concept of BOT projects are also gaining popularity. What we normally say is toll roads, there are many structures of BOT, but BOT normally we refer to as build, operate and transfer. So, private operators, private investors are encouraged to uh, invest in road sector through this mechanism. So, for this kind of BOT or annuity projects, another consultant sometimes are appointed, they are known as independent consultant. So, they basically supervise the entire work of study including the design, carrying out the economic and financial viability, deciding the final terms for BOT, annuity, etcetera. So, our focus again, although we have described three steps, our focus will be primarily on step 1. So, now let us look at the step 1, particularly the sequence of activities in details. It starts with notice inviting expression of interest, we will describe each of the steps. Then a number of consultants, they express their interest for the project try to show their capability for the project. Then the client carries out shortlisting, maybe 20 consultant applied. So, they may decide, okay, we will pick up 5 and 6, the best in the lot and they will only submit proposals for further consideration. So, this issue invitation for RFP, request for proposal, based on RFP consultants or so selected consultants, they submit proposals, then proposals are evaluated and the best one is selected. Then the client goes for negotiation and then finally, the contract is awarded. Once the contract is awarded to the consultant, the first thing consultant normally does, he, he submits the quality assurance plan, QAP then prepare the inception report and submits it, then carry out the feasibility study and submit the feasibility report, then submit the PPR preliminary project report, then carry out the DPR detail engineering and submit the detailed project report and finally, prepare the ICB document. That is a typical flow activity, not that for every project it has to be exactly the same. But what I am trying to indicate, this is a typical project, what, what we do in a typical project, what we do, I have tried to indicate all the steps. So, UI, shortlisting, invitation for RFP, then submission of proposal, evaluation of proposals, negotiation, final award of contract. Up to this, it is selecting a particular consultant most suitable one for carrying out the job. Then what consultant does? He prepares QAP quality assurance plan, inception report, feasibility report, preliminary engineering and submit prepare, carry out detail engineering and submit DPR detail project report and then finally, it terminates with the preparation of ICB document. Now, we shall discuss about each of these activities in details. First, let us take expression of interest. Whenever a project is there, for a big project, maybe a highway is to be upgraded. So, the consultant put it in media and it is known to others that the government or the client is taking up a project and they say that they may invite all interested consultants to apply to show their interest, if they are interested in the project, they have to show their interest to the client by submitting a document what is called as expression of interest. By name itself, you can understand it is an expression of interest to show that you are interested or a group or a 
consultant is interested to carry out the work. Now, once they submit the document, they have to show their interest based on credentials. So, I am again, I am not trying to give a comprehensive list of items, but only trying to touch some of the major items what normally are included in the expression of interest. Let us look at those things. It gives an idea about the company profile saying the company, about the company, what is the manpower, what are the areas it works, what are the type of services it works, then general qualification and experience, what kind of stuff it has, what kind of experience the company has, then what is the experience in the field of highway and transportation engineering in general. I am mentioning all these things keeping in mind the highway and transportation engineering projects. So, they have to uh, say that what is their experience in the field of highway and transportation engineering, then relevant experience carried out and ongoing projects. What are the a particular type of project government or the client has put? So, what is the experience of the firm specific to that kind of project apart from the general highway and transportation engineering project? So, that also they try to indicate and they also have to indicate the financial status. The whole purpose is you include all the papers showing a background of the company saying that yes, C company provides services in these areas, document it showing that what are the works you have carried out in the related area and also in the area specific to this kind of project. Also so, what are the man, what is the manpower available, what all different specialists are available with you or with the organization and also one has to include the financial status that also have to be reported. So, all this material will go together under one cover known as expression of interest and that will be submitted to the client. Client after receiving this uh, expression of interest from a number of consultants, they will go through the documents and they will pick up some numbers may be 4, 5, 6, 7 whatever it is and once they get convinced that all those people have the potential to carry out the job. So, they will pick up among all people who expressed interest for the work or among all the companies who expressed interest for the work. The client may pick up some 4 or 5 consultants where they think that they are the best in the lot. So, to them the client will issue the RFP that means, only those consultants they will be allowed to submit a full fledged proposal. So, the client will indicate or send a letter of invitation and the whole RFP document to only to selected consultants. So, that is what is RFP document. Normally, it has got two sections. Section 1 is general which includes the letter of invitation, general information to consultants, it gives the standard forms and submittal required for technical proposal, standard forms and submittals for financial proposal because normally this technical and financial proposals are submitted under different covers. So, one will be technical proposal and the other one will be financial proposal. So, they will be two different under two different covers. So, it says all the forms and formalities and requirement for submission of technical proposal and also in which form the financial proposal to be submitted all the forms and other submittals. It also indicates the date of opening of proposal, the process for proposal evaluation, the process for negotiation, award of contract and it also includes normally the standard form of contract. Part 2 or section 2 is known as terms of reference. This is a very crucial component in the in any project because if the TOR is specific, the project will run smoothly. For every project, 
it is absolutely necessary that the TUR remains very specific and clear and does not have any statement, any ambiguous statements or should not keep any gray area. More precise the TUR, more comfortable will be the execution part of the project. It will run smoothly and comfortably. TUR includes background of the project, it outlines the scope of service, very, very important component. It has to be very specific. Consultant should know very clearly from the client what is the exact scope of service, what is the exact or what are the exact works that client are expecting the consultant to carry out. Then it tells about the sequence of project preparation, schedule of completion, how much time is required for what activity. It also tells what data services and facilities the client will provide to the consultant describes the final output precisely, again it is very important, what are the reports that the consultant would like to receive, uh, consultant have to submit to the client, what are the drawings, how many numbers of copies or how many in num uh, reports or how many copies of the report or how many copies of the drawings, all these things should be mentioned very precisely. If really uh, a TUR is good all this information should be given with clarity without any ambiguity. Then it also in should indicate the procedure for review of report and it tells what are the key personals or key positions that are required for carrying out the project. Suppose it is a highway project, so in most of the cases TUR itself will say what are the key personals required for the project, that means what are the key positions and key staff requirement. Obviously, there will be other uh, junior support staff who will also get involved in the project, but they will clearly identify, they would clearly like to see and mention the key positions. Now, let us look at the key positions for a typical highway project. Again, let me mention it clearly, this is a typical uh, key composition of uh, key staff composition. Uh, not that for every project it will be same, it depends also that what are the aspects that are important for a project. So, some key positions may be there in some projects, some key position may be omitted in another project, uh, may be the time duration also for different key positions may vary, but this is just an indication. It includes senior highway engineer come team leader, there will be one team leader responsible for the overall project and normally he is a senior highway engineer. Then you have a deputy team leader in some cases who is also a highway engineer. Then you have pavement specialist sometimes under senior pavement specialist and pavement specialist. Then you have bridge specialist again it may be senior bridge specialist and bridge specialist. Sometimes if uh, foreign experts are necessary uh, senior bridge specialist may be foreign expert. Uh, bridge specialist may be domestic expert or maybe senior pavement specialist may be foreign expert and pavement specialist may be bridge experts like that also indications may be given. Then uh, traffic engineer that is another key position, material calm geotechnical engineer, senior survey engineer, survey engineer, transportation economist to carry out the economic evaluation of the project, environmental specialist to carry out EIA for the project, then resettlement specialist to look after the resettlement and rehabilitation aspect of the project. So, it is quite interesting to see that uh, you have essentially all uh, specializations of civil engineering and even beyond that. You have highway engineer, you have pavement engineer, you have traffic engineer, you have structural engineer, maybe the bridge engineer, you have geotechnical engineer or specialist, you have environmental specialist, you have survey engineer, you have uh, transportation economist, you have resettlement rehabilitation experts. So, it is completely a team activity or a group activity including all different specializations of civil engineering and also it goes beyond that. 
Now, let us look at the technical and financial proposals. Technical proposals, as I have already told, technical and financial proposals are submitted separately under two separate cover. Technical proposals normally includes firms reference with past experience and PDAs. If the client has got, consultant has got any comments and suggestion on the terms of reference and or on the data, services and facilities to be provided by the client, that also should be included. It should include description of the methodology and work plan in detail, team composition and task assignments, what are the people you are putting and what are the work they are supposed to do, that is what is the task assignment. Then the CVs of the proposed key pers professional staff for all the key position, one has to provide the CV in required format. It should also include the activity schedule, how the different activities are planned and the time schedule for professional staff. For different staff, what will be the time they will work in the project? Maybe a project may be for 12 month duration, but the traffic engineer may work only for two months. Okay, a transportation economist may work for one month. So, and then during which period they will work, either full time or part time. For some time maybe continuously they will work, for some other time they may be uh, working uh, partly. So, all these things should be included. I am showing a typical format of the project data sheet where the way it is given, this is just an indication. You can see it includes the project name, the country where the assignment has been carried out, project location within the country, number of professional staff provided, start date, completion date, approximate cost of the project, approximate value of service, name of the associated firm if any, number of man months of professional staff provided by associated firm, name of the senior staff and position held in the project, narrative description of the project and description of actual services provided by the firm. So, in one page, in a summary form, you try to provide all informations. So, if you have, if a company has carried out maybe 10 projects uh, in related area, for every project there will be one page PDS normally. Sometimes it will also include the photographs showing the relevant features, whatever improvement has been done or whatever mechanism has been followed indicating something about that. So, this for every project this PDS will be included. So, PDS gives in a crisp form, it tells about the you know task that has been carried out by the firm. Financial proposal includes maybe summary of cost, breakdown of cost per activity, breakdown of remuneration for of key professionals, reimbursable cost, miscellaneous expenses. So, there will be different components. You have the total cost and then under different components as indicated in the terms of reference. Coming to the evaluation of proposal, technical evaluation is done first in most of the cases and then the financial evaluation is done. In process of technical evaluation, there will be marks on different aspects, how the methodology has been written for the work, what are the CVs that the consultant has provided uh, for different key positions. So, there will be marks for every CV and then for different marks for different key positions, some marks for comments, some marks of the experience and overall evaluation will be done. Generally, a minimum mark say 75 percent, 75 out of 100 is required for qualifying into technical evaluation and only for the consultants who have qualified technically, for technically qualified consultants only the financial bid will be opened. For others, it will be returned, normally it will be returned without opening. This 75 is again an indication, different organization may follow different procedures, some may follow 80, some may follow 70, but normally it is uh, 75 percent that is taken as a benchmark. Then, then during financial evaluation, 100 marks is given to the consultant with the lowest price, so he get full marks because of the lowest price and for other consultant, the mark is reduced in proportion to quoted price. Say for example, uh, 18 lakhs is the minimum and if 20 marks is for the financial part. So, a consultant which has quoted 18, uh, 18 lakhs, he gets 20. A consultant which has quoted 20, he gets 18 marks. 18, uh, 20 into 18 by 20. So, it is again 18 marks. So, like that, 
in proportion the mark is reduced and then finally, uh, both the technical and the financial aspects are considered marks obtained in the technical evaluation, marks obtained in the financial evaluation, then sometimes they give 60 percent weightage for uh, technical, 40 percent of financial, in some projects it may be 80 percent on technical, 20 percent on financial, this again varies. But then finally, whatever is the criteria as mentioned in the uh, RFP, uh, based on that this technical score and financial score may be added and the client and the company or the consultant uh, giving scoring the maximum, the work normally is awarded to him or to that uh, party. Now based on combined score of technical and financial evaluation, the highest ranking consultant is asked to negotiate clarify, confirm the availability of their key personnel once more because sometimes it might have taken some time after the submission of proposal. So, they once again confirm whether all those key stuff are available, whether all the facilities are available till now and then on compliance the contract is awarded to the, uh, the contract is awarded to that particular consultant. Now, once the work is awarded, the very first thing consultant does normally submission of the quality assurance plan. Now, quality assurance plan is the consultant's commitment of producing a quality DPR. The consultant will produce the report and this is uh, an assurance that uh, is a commitment that they will produce a quality DPR. Now, quality assurance plan comprises of quality goals and objective basically which includes the compliance with codal provisions and TOR by controlling human skill. It tells about the purpose of QAP, basically to spell out in written terms the sequence and step of uh, to be followed uh, to ensure a quality project. It also indicates about the elements of quality assurance system and includes a detailed approach and methodology for carrying out the work. Now, QAP needs to be formulated for various activities like topographic surveys, traffic surveys, geotechnical and material investigations, condition survey and design of bridges and structures, design of highways and pavements, economic and financial analysis, environmental and social impacts. For all these aspects, QAP needs to be formulated. So, the QAP is formulated and submitted. Next is submission of inception report. Inception report is basically to convey to the client the clear understanding of the terms of reference and define in details the methodology. Normally, the inception report is submitted within 30 days. Inception report should include whatever all primary data that have been calculated uh, that have been collected by the consultant. Normally, it includes the traffic survey data, topographic survey data and either partly or fully and it talks about the preliminary inventory survey. So, if any primary data collection has been done that had to be reported, either partly it is done or fully it is done accordingly it is to be mentioned. Then it should indicate about the status for the secondary data collection. It is a big list and the consultant should indicate in the report so far or till that time whatever secondary data he has been able to collect. This secondary data includes a number of items, I will quickly go through it. Survey of India topographic sheets which are required, geological maps, satellite maps if available particularly for construction of or planning of bypass, the GTS benchmark location and levels any vision document, statement, report if available on the strategy of future development in the project influence area, what are the future developments that the local authorities or bodies are planning to achieve. Then previous traffic count data for the last 5 to 10 years, the geotechnical data of old and new bridges if available and cross drainage structures, PWD identified public works department identified query for sand, stone chips and other materials because all these materials are to be uh, transported from queries. So, what are the PWD identified queries that also should be known. So, all this 
secondary information will be required. Existing schedule of rates for calculation of the cost of the states or districts, authenticated information on the right of way, it is a very, very crucial component. It is extremely difficult in most of the cases to get right information and correct information about the right of way or ROW. Meteorological data, classified vehicle registration data of the states, project influence area, at least for the five year, last five years. Underground overhead utilities, which may re require shifting or which may affect widening or geometric improvement proposals. Statistical economic data of the PIA for the last 5 to 10 years, including the net state domestic product, per capita income, population, maybe at the national level, uh, the GDP data, gross domestic product data, then accident information and identification of potentially black spots. All these include all come under secondary information. So, it is a big list. So, when this report is submitted, the client or the consultant should, should indicate to what extent uh, or how much secondary information he has been able to collect by that time and whatever information is available, some analysis to be done and accordingly reported. Then comes the submission of feasibility report. Now, this report is generally submitted within a period of normally 3 to 4 months. It includes executive summary telling the summary of the whole report, it key plan with exact location of various traffic surveys and homogeneous section, it should, uh, it should show uh, that uh, what are the locations where the traffic service has been carried out and how the homogeneous sections have been divided or decided. It should indicate about the methodologies that were adopted for the studies. It should describe the technical and engineering alternatives, whether you know uh, a, a, a kind of maybe two different technical options are there and it should indicate, it should compare also. It should talk about the requirements of service road and toll plaza and other facilities, report about the traffic service and analysis. Also include preliminary ins inspection reports on bridges and other structures like road over bridges, road under bridges, ROB, ROB, etcetera. It also should include requirements or talk about requirements of new ROB, ROB bridges, flyovers and all other sorts of structures that are required. Give a detailed project description. It should include a preliminary environmental analysis and screening, preliminary social impact screening, include the strip plan showing details of utilities that may require shifting or relocation. Include about the pavement study and identification of sections for carrying out required tests related to design of pavements and investigation on subgrade and other properties. It should include a bulk park cost estimate, not a detailed cost, but uh, some block cost estimate. It should also report preliminary, preliminary economic analysis that has been carried out based on block cost and whatever information and analysis uh, are done till that time based on all those whatever is the preliminary economic evaluation that uh, is available and then indicative design standards and specification and then finally conclusions and recommendations. All these aspects are to be covered. Then comes the submission of preliminary project report PPR. Structure wise it is more or less similar to whatever I have mentioned in the feasibility study report. Again executive summary conclusions, introduction, methodology, description of the project stake with location map, highway design, traffic survey, topographic survey, pavement design, drainage and hydrology survey. Geotechnical and material investigation, bridges, culverts, environmental impact assessment, project cost estimate and economic evaluation. So, item wise if you see this feasibility study and PPR, item wise they are not different, they are generally same, same items are there. 
So, because the items are same, it is necessary for us to understand what is the difference between feasibility and PPR, because once I have showed that these are the things to be included in feasibility report and then once I show about the PPR, more or less the same items are shown. So, it is necessary to clarify uh, or to understand clearly what is the difference between the feasibility report and the PPR report. Basically, the basic difference lies in the allocation of time frame and details of work. Items remain same, maybe you are reporting traffic survey, but at feasibility state may not be, it may not be completed. Topographic survey, it may not be over by that time. Pavement related info, uh, investigation, so whatever is required even for carrying out the PPR, they are not over. So, whatever is the status, some places some investigations have been completed, some are yet to be completed, whatever is the status, based on this status, what is the overall summary or overall findings that we try to present. In the feasibility stage, best or optimum alignment and various technical improvements of the project stage after considering relevant environmental and social impact, cost effectiveness and economic viability are worked out. The PPR report aims at providing a selected workable proposal with more details to arrive at a realistic cost assessment. Obviously, more data is available, more investigation reports are available. So, we can have a better cost estimate, better assessment, better economic evaluation report. The proposal is studied for any discrepancy or bottleneck that one may face during preparation of DPR. So, essentially items remain same, the difference is in the allocated time frame and details of work. Then comes the DPR and ICB document, detailed project report. This includes detailed designs and drawings, preparation of detailed cost estimate based on detailed engineering. Already we have detailed engineering available with us. So, accordingly one can calculate the detailed cost, preparation of bid document, etcetera. As per the approved PPR and RAP, complying with all directions given by the clients while approving the PPR and RAP. Maybe clients are given some suggestions and comments and all the advices, those are to be considered and final uh, detailed engineering to be done and taking all the items detailed report, project report and ICB document to be prepared. Now, ICB document comprises technical specifications, bill of quantities and detailed drawing as in the DPR conditions of contract etcetera as per international standards and following World Bank or ADB guideline as the case may be. So, finally, the DPR is ready. So, we screen the preliminary alternative at the PPS stage itself, take the final one and then go for detailed engineering, detailed design and then prepare the final report what is known as DPR. And once the DPR is ready, based on that, the ICB document is prepared. Now, let me ask quickly some of the questions. Mention the sequence of activities normally followed for preparation of DPR and ICB document for road development projects. Number two, what is expression of interest or UI? What are the items normally included in UI? Third, mention typical composition of team of experts for preparation of highway projects. The last question is, what is the difference between feasibility and the PPR? Because there is only one lesson in module 1, I will also answer these questions now itself. Let us quickly go through the answers. Mention the sequence of activities normally followed for preparation of DPR and ICB document for road development projects. It starts from notice inviting tender, notice inviting expression of interest, then shortlisting, then invitation for request for proposal, then submission of proposal by the selected clients, evaluation of proposal, negotiation, award of contract, submission of quality assurance plan, submission of inception report, carrying out the feasibility and submission of feasibility report, carrying out the preliminary engineering and submission of preliminary project report 
carrying out detailed engineering and submission of detailed project report and preparation and submission of ICGB document. That is the sequence. Then question 2, what is the expression of interest? You know, whenever you have a work, a company showing their interest for the job. So, it includes basically company profile, general qualification and experience, experience in the fields of highway and transportation engineering, relevant services carried out and ongoing projects and financial status. So, when there is a project that is to be taken up by the client, all consultants should think themselves qualified for the job may submit the expression of interest showing that they are interested for the job and also indicating that they have the required capability, experience, profile for carrying out the job. So, one way it is showing the ex interest and other way it is expressing their credibility or background and their qualifications for the similar job. Mention typical composition of team of experts for preparation of highway projects. It includes highway engineer, pavement engineer, bridge specialist, traffic engineer, material come geotechnical engineer, survey engineer, transport economist, environment specialist and resettlement specialist. So, all sorts of specializations are included, all specializations of civil engineering and beyond that. Now, what is the difference between the feasibility and PPR? The basic difference is the allocated time frame and details of the work. Some of the investigations might not be over at feasibility stage, which may be completed at the uh, TPR. So, cost estimate and all assessments are more realistic and relatively more accurate in the PPR report. Feasibility reports the D then status of the project. So, basic difference lies in the allocated time frame and details of work. Thank you.